So good morning, everybody, and welcome to another broadcast with us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, and we do have some new kids joining us today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Now, before I dive in with today's topic, I've got a few quick housekeeping notes. First and foremost, between our talk and our Q&A, we are going to have a little quiz together. Five questions, test your understanding, have a little bit of fun, just an extra way of keeping it extra interactive today. So I'll be sure to get that link in the StreamYard chat and the YouTube chat for anyone tuning in there. I'm also particularly excited today because we are continuing just an incredible week of live broadcast from the field. It's something that we specialize in as an organization, and it's so thrilling to get to bring some of the coolest science on planet Earth live from the field into your classrooms. Tomorrow, we're going to the Turtle Hospital in Marathon, Florida, where we're rescuing sea turtles that have been injured. Yesterday, we were on the beach in Nicaragua after having gone through the mangroves to release baby sea turtle hatchlings. And right now, I am thrilled to be hosting for the very first time, Allison and Salma. So they are PhD students working on understanding one of the coolest animals on this planet, the elephant seal. I can't believe we get the chance to see these live, frankly. They're like one of the greatest mammals, coolest creatures on planet Earth. We are off the coast of California. I know we've got a lot of Californian students today, so this is something that's right in your backyard and you have the opportunity to go check out this place in person the Ano Nuevo uh, Preserve I'm so excited to turn you over to them to walk through their research the work that they do the tools that they use and to learn more about this incredible species and so without further ado Allison and Selma welcome to the broadcast <laughs> hi everyone we're hi. super excited to be here today and to talk to you about seals uh, my name's Allison and I am a PhD student at UC Santa Cruz. So if you don't know where Santa Cruz is, it's about an hour and a half south of San Francisco, Golden Gate Bridge. And uh, I study elephant seals and um, use trackers on elephant seals with little uh, acoustic recorders to try to listen to the sounds of the ocean as the seals swim. And my name is Selma. I'm also a PhD student with Allison. And I study elephant seals by also putting instruments on them. To tr but in this case, I'm interested in studying where they're going to find fish and how long they stay out at sea um, and just understanding what they're how they're behaving when they're out at sea. Yeah, so we're going to tell you a little bit about why we're here today. So Selma and I both have uh, these projects that involve putting really fancy equipment onto elephant seals. Um, <laughs> the equipment is really expensive, so sometimes a seal will have five to $10,000 worth of technology on its back. And it will carry that off um, into the Pacific Ocean, thousands of miles offshore, thousands of feet below the surface. So we're trying to get these seals to tell us about the deep ocean, places that we could never go by ourselves. And um, the only reason we get our gear back is because the seals come back out onto the beach uh, after their trips out to sea. This is like their home. Yeah, this is home base. Yeah. Um, and do you want to talk about recites and why we do them? Sure. So in order for us to be able to pick out animals that are good candidates for these really expensive instruments, we need to have a good understanding of the whole population. And the way we do that is by doing recites, which are done every day by different groups of people in our lab groups. And what that essentially entails is just uh, different crews hiking the beach and looking for animals that have these flipper tags. They look like, um, uh, like cattle ear tags. It's like what you would see on cows if you're driving on the highway. Exactly. Um, and we put out about 500 flipper tags on animals that were every year that were born that year. And that's how we kind of build up our census of the colony. And from there, we'll be able to track animals throughout their life and we'll be able to then pick out good candidates. So animals that regularly come back home. Um, so we can then pick them out for instrument procedures and figure out how they're behaving when they're out at sea um, and what they're feeding on and where they're going and things like that. Yeah, so all, but not all of them, but a lot of these animals have individual little tags, which is kind of like their name. It's how we track them yeah. over time. Um, and if you look closely in this uh, group of animals, you might see a couple of marks. I see some kind of further over towards the left in the back. Um, not sure if you'll be able to see that, but uh, these are kind of like the animals' names, and we can use them to track individual animals year after year after year. So that way we can know when a specific animal is coming back to the beach. We can know how they're doing, if they're healthy. We can know if they had a pup. 
Um, we can know how that pup is doing every year. So we can kind of track generations of seals. Um, and we've been doing this for about uh, five decades now. So we have over 300,000 sightings of over 50,000 seals over that time. Yeah, and we're going to show you a few of the tools that we use. So this here is our data book. So this is how we record um, data in the field. It's super important to have really neat handwriting like Selma does um, so that you can understand what's happening. Uh, do you want to tell them about what each column does? Sure. Um, so this column right here, that is the area. So we have these unique um, different letter codes that describe different beaches of the colony. And that's how we figure out like where animals are seen. And then this column right here is the unique flipper tag code that Allison was talking about. So we always start off with the first digit is always, sorry, the seals are being rowdy. Um, the first digit is always the first letter of the color of the tag. So in this case, this was an orange tag, but most tags here are going to be green tags. And so the first digit's always G. Um, and then the other four digits are that unique code that are on that flipper tag. So this animal right here is GL236. So its flipper tag was GL236 and it was green. Um, and in this case, we could only see that this tag was on the left flipper. Um, we tried to get as complete of a tag read as possible, um, but seals are wild animals and they behave of their own accord. Sorry, it's a bit loopy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, for, so sometimes we do the best with what we can. And if we're able to get a full tag read like this animal right here, um, this flipper tag was on the right, it was on the inner uh, lower flipper, and it was the spike of the tag was on the inside. And this animal also happened to have a mark, a die mark um, that was put out that also corresponds with the four, four digit code of its flipper. Um, and this mark was on the right side of the animal. So this is a very complete tag read, and we try to do our best by getting as much information as possible, including the age of the animal. This was a yearling, um, so that we can really build up that database and have a good understanding of the baseline population. Yeah, and like someone was saying, it can be really hard to get a full um, tag read. And so when we can, we mark the animals with hair dye. And it's the same hair dye that you would use on yourself. It's actually the biggest research expense in the uh, in this part of our research program, except for paying people. Um, and Selma's going to show you just what our little dye kit looks like. It is uh, a two part mixture, um, and it's just like the hair dye that you would get from the from the drugstore it's clear all nice and easy um we try like allison said this is our biggest research expense funnily enough um and so we try to not mix up the whole bottle this bottle is about one fourth full i poured out about a fourth of it today um for our recite effort um and so we'll mix this up in a different bottle and then we will write the code of the animal just the four digit code not the first digit with the color uh, we'll write it backwards on a piece of two by four. Uh, yeah, there's and, a mark. Oh, yeah, there's actually a mark. Oh, so I don't know if you guys can see where my finger is right there. This animal trying to point at the camera. Yeah. This animal has a mark on it. I think if you take your finger away yeah. now, it will refocus. But uh, it says K137. Uh, it's, it's a bit sandy, but he's on the move right now. So that's kind of like a real example of what these <laughs> hair dye marks look like. Um, and you can see that although this mark is a little difficult to see right now because it is sandy, it's a lot easier to see than that animal's flipper tags. And I can just see the flash of green on his left flipper, um, but I can't really see what it, what it says on it or anything like that without using binoculars or a camera maybe. But even then, I don't think I would be able to get a good tag read. And so this is why marking animals when you have a good chance with hair dye really helps us out so that we don't um, miss more animals just because we can't see those small little green flipper tags. Yeah, we also have a couple of other cool tools that we use. We have radios that we use to talk to each other on the beach um, just in case, you know, we need help with something. Um, we have a first aid kit. 
because seals are wild animal or animals and they are carnivores and they can bite. So it's really important not to get too close um, and not to uh, disturb them too much because they definitely can bite. Um, what else do we have? And we have our binos, one of our most important tools, which is binoculars. Um, if you've ever used binoculars before, you know they take some practice. Uh, but if we're sitting up here on the hill, it's really hard to see those marks and uh, tags from all the way up here. So a lot of times we use binoculars and cameras um, to be able to see them. And uh, I guess just a few more uh, facts about these seals. So most of the ones we're looking at right now are juveniles. We're here during the fall. And so um, almost all of the seals will come back uh, right around the beginning of January in order to breed and mate. And so this is actually not a lot of seals right now um, for what Año Nuevo has to offer. Uh, and in this, the breeding season around the winter, there will be tons and tons of breeding females, big males fighting each other um, and mothers giving birth to and nursing their pups. Um, the moms will nurse their pups for about 30 days and then that's it, the pups are done. Um, they never see their pups again. Uh, and they'll head back out to sea to keep feeding. Um, yeah, and want to add anything to that? Uh, there, we are out here year round and we study these animals throughout different parts of their life history. So breeding season is one of the most chaotic times of year just because all of the adults are back um, and the adult males are back and really uh, ready to mate. And so they have these really aggressive displays of uh, competition for females. But also, for example, my project is studying the juveniles. And so we'll be also be doing recites and uh, sedation procedures for instruments in the juvenile vault, molt, which is a lot uh, more it's a lot it's a lot different it's still very um chaotic but it's in its own way instead of all the adults being back and babies everywhere and adult males fighting it's a lot of you know teenagers that are fighting with one another and interacting and so um and that's also when they're shedding all their fur so they can look really silly um and so it's a really kind of a really cool experience to see that this colony throughout different parts of the year and see how the animals behave and um, interact with one another during different parts of their annual cycle. Yeah, and you might notice that some of them look really fat. Um, <laughs> these seals are super, super fat. They are the largest pinniped, which is uh, seals, sea lions, walruses. They're the largest of all of those. Um, and they are also incredible athletes. So they, yeah, they don't necessarily look it, but they um, can swim, like I said, thousand miles offshore and dive for uh, their typical dive is about 20 minutes, but they can dive for up to two hours if they need to. Um, and they spend months at sea um, surviving on just a couple hours of sleep a night um, doing dive after dive to they can go a mile below the surface. So they are really, really um, incredible athletes and incredible animals. Very, very cool. Allison Salma, this is amazing. And what a great shot and such cool information about how you're doing all the research there. Um, I'm going to do a cahoot with our classes in just a minute before we dive in with Q&A. But I want to harp on this point of their size for a second, because this is my entry point into elephant seals. How big can they get? Like how heavy, how long? If there's anything you can share with us while I pull up our cahoot, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> okay. I don't know what that Sorry, I... Your audio got pretty quiet for a second there. Could you oh, repeat that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was just saying we're going to do our Kahoot soon. I just wanted to follow up with a quick question before we go for our class questions, which is you talked about how fat they are. How long and how heavy do they get? Because that's one of the coolest things about them. Yeah, great question. <laughs> so um, there's a really big difference between the males and the females. The females are um, about 1,500 pounds. And the males are three times as heavy as that. So they're about 4,500 pounds uh, in terms of length. Yeah, in terms of length, they can be anywhere from like about 12 feet at, when they're adults, 12 feet to 16 feet. And the males can get long. Um, and yeah, so I was actually just t telling a few school children yesterday that um, the difference in males and females is like a two-seater car is about the size of a female that you see driving around. 
and, and a full size male is about the size of like a big Ford truck. Um, so it's a pretty big difference between adult males and females. But they're both so, quite big. They're both still like, quite big. They're both still cars. <laughs> so big. I mean, uh, just for context, as we were talking with the leatherback turtle the other day, sort of another big ocean wanderer. And I mean, if you're a grade four class, which a lot of our classes are today, it's like all the kids in your class combined weigh as much as one seal. If that, probably you might even need to get a second class of kids for one seal. So these are huge, huge animals. That's why they have that first aid kit. And it's why they're not standing down amidst all the seals. But these are big, powerful, powerful animals. Uh, one of the great sort of ocean creatures. So I'm sure we're going to get many more questions on their biology and your work and more. But first, we're going to go with a quick kahoot together. Uh, just to test some understanding, have a little bit of fun. Now, Allison and Selma, they don't win anything, but they do win our everlasting respect if they win this. So uh, I think that's worth quite a bit. Uh, we're going to dive in. And for those who are new to Kahoot, the faster you answer, the more points you get. We're going to go to Miss Lou's class right after that for a question when we come back for Q&A. But if you want to help us with a few seconds to go in any of these questions, you're welcome to give us little hints. All right. Where is the Elephant Seal Beach or Preserve? What state? We've talked about this a bunch, but I want, we're going to test some quick as quick as you can answer, Oregon, New York, California, or North Carolina. They all sound pretty nice to me. I honestly, I want to go south. I'm in Newfoundland. It's getting very cold here. So I, I'm I'm ready for summer already. And we're not even at winter. Get those answers in quick. Nice, guys. And you can yell them out in your classes as well. So everyone got California. Very good. You were all listening. Gold star to you all. Witty Octopus takes our lead. Got that answer in really fast. All right. Question two. How many elephant seals are there in the world? About how many? 500, 10,000, 200,000, or 500,000? We didn't explicitly talk about this, but we can get, I, I'm curious what your thoughts are again. No worries if you get anything wrong. This is the joy of taking part in quizzes. All right. Ooh, good mix. No one picked 500, but 200,000 is the accurate answer. So two of our, our group get this right. Um, It's a lot less than mankind. It's fairly sizable for a population of, of big animals. But, uh, and again, we get to see a lot of them on these beaches, which is really, really cool. All right. Inspired Pony takes your lead. Alice and Selma, we're in question three. We're, we're whipping through these. Killer whales are not predators of elephant seals. True or false? I don't know. What do we think? are wolves of the sea. They eat blue whales. They eat great white sharks. They eat everything false. So they, they are predators. Yeah. The great killer whales are really, they're, they're voracious. They're the scariest thing in the ocean. I actually encourage our classes, look up a killer whale skull when you're done this broadcast. It's scarier than any dinosaur skull ever, like ever by a huge margin. All right. Elephant seals can hold their breath for, we just talked about this. Two minutes, six minutes, 15 minutes, 23 minutes. This is for an average dive, much less the longer one. That might be a hint for you all. Hmm, how long do they go underwater? I can hold my breath for like two minutes at the most. I think Kate, Win Kate Winslet got to seven in the last Avatar movie, so good for her. But 23 minutes is our correct answer. And again, Alice and Selma, up to two hours underwater? Yeah. Like, that is yeah. wild. Incredible. Yeah. Don't try this at home, kids. Literally, you're not an elephant seal. You can't do it. Uh, Witty Octopus has our lead. Going into our final question. Another true or false. Elephant seals dive deep to avoid their main predator. So we talked about how deep they can dive. Is Do they do that to avoid predators? Do they just stay at the surface and, you know, get angry? Look at them the wrong way? Wag their fingers? I don't know. I think they might dive deep. Seems like a good strategy. Seems like a good strategy for lots of things. If you can do it. And the answer, yes, everybody got this right. It is true. Uh, up to a mile down is ridiculous. I, just for understanding for our kids, at a mile down, like humans could never survive that far down. Like there's a cool adaptation to enable it. It's freezing cold. It's incredible pressure and it's pitch black. So it's a really unique ecosystem on this planet in the deep sea where the elephant seals get to go. So with that, Jolly Hamster's third, Inspired Pony is second. These aren't their real names. No, no spoilers there. Witty Octopus is in first. All right. Way to go, everyone. Cahoots, thank you so much for taking part in that. And we are going to go live with questions. So we got a huge time for Q&A today. This is very exciting. Uh, Ms. Lou's class, grade four. Welcome in. And Milton, if you want to kick us off, you are mm -hmm. good to go. Hello. Okay. Oh, there we are. Thank you. Welcome so, in. How deep can elephant seals bite into human skin? And also our class from the Cahoot. Ooh, nice job on the Kahoot. How, how deep can they bite into human skin? <laughs> That's a good question. So they have 
a really, really powerful jaw. So they're more going for force. Their teeth are not particularly sharp, um, but they create would create big puncture wounds. Um, yeah. I don't know exactly how deep. I don't know how long their teeth are. Uh, yeah, I'm not, actually, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. <laughs> Their teeth are can be pretty large. About, um, I I have never seen like an adult male, but the juvenile males that we work with are still pretty large. Their canines can be about longer than my thumb, which is about like two inches long. Yeah, um, and they're still juvenile, so they're they have pretty big teeth. <laughs> I think the moral of the story is, I mean, we're talking about like 12 to 16 foot plus animals. So it's like two tigers back to back. If you don't want a tiger biting you, you don't want an elephant seal biting you. If you're in that situation, you've done something very wrong. So I like I like the thought process, though. Very savage to begin. <laughs> um, Ms. Reed's class, uh, grade fours, if you want to unmute your mic, welcome in uh, and come on up for a question. Hi, fourth graders. Take your time. Come on up. Come see us. Welcome in in Escondido. We've got our, our first California crew. Thank hey. you. I don't. I don't think we have any questions yet, though. That's okay. I can come back in a minute. Take your time. No hurry at all. Let me know in the chat, and I'll come and pop you in. But we'll head to Miss Wafer's class. They're a virtual school with kids all over the world. Uh, if you want to come in at Laurel Springs School, take us away. Hi. Yes, we have students all over the world. They are in a Zoom room watching my screen share. And Julia is in eleventh grade. She's actually in Europe. And she's, well, first of all, she's wondering, are they friendly, which kind of connects to what you were just talking about. And also, what is the field of science that the two of you are in? Is it ecology? Is it zoology? What, um, yeah, what do you, how do you become doing what you're doing, basically? Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Um, well, are they friendly? It's, it kind of just, most of the time they don't care about you if you're not um, too close to them especially during breeding season, uh, adult females can get really aggressive. Uh, so I would say not super friendly at that point. Uh, but they're friendly from a distance, I guess, is where I'll land on that. Yeah, uh, ambivalent at best. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we are both um, in the ecology and evolutionary biology department at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and both came to it from kind of a marine biology kind of background um and yeah i i studied cognitive science in my undergrad and then did a master's in marine science before coming here to to really become an ecologist but also worked on whale watching boats and worked as a um after school instructor and as a museum educator and all kinds of stuff in the meantime cool. yeah. uh, um, i also came from a marine biology background but when i was an undergrad I actually worked with um, urchins and sand dollars, sea urchins and sand dollars, and I got really interested in research and I loved looking at how animals respond to their environment and uh, started working with marine mammal stranding networks after that. Um, and it didn't freak me out. I just kind of kept going until I found my position and it's like, this is the right fit for my research interests and for the skills that I've accumulated over the years. What a great answer. And thanks to our, our grade 11 student who might be considering a career in this field. I've got to say, Alison, I'm also an ecologist and evolutionary biologist by background. It is by far the best biology. When you go into <laughs> university, you have the choice. You have cell and systems, which is like genetics, and that's all fine. But if you do this sort of thing, you get to be in a cool beach in California with elephant seals. So, I mean, we'll, we'll weigh that I think we're winning the, the ladies here today. So thank you for that, Ms. Wafers class. Um, we got a question online written in. Um, what other places do the elephant seals come up on the beach? Is it just California? Is it uh, any other spot in the world that you can share with us? Yeah. Um, so there. So northern elephant seals are found uh, all up and down the North American um, coast, and they kind of their range, their haul out range extends from California to Baja, and the I think the southernmost colony is in the Guadalupe Islands, um, just off of the coast of Mexico. And there are a couple rookeries that are nearby to Año Nuevo, actually, that we sometimes will follow the seals to to retrieve instruments. Um, so the other colonies that we typically travel to are Point Reyes, which is just north of us. It's close to San Francisco. Um, and just south of us is Piedras Blancas. Um, and those are also pretty well established. And, well, in the case of Point Reyes, they're up and coming rookeries that are currently establishing, but Point Pedras Blancas is pretty well established. Um, and uh, another colony that 
we've done research at, uh, our lab group has done research at, is the Channel Islands um, off of the coast of California. But those are the most substantial ones, but there are known rookeries all up and down the California uh, North Mexico coast. Yeah, so. and there are also southern elephant seals. So this is the northern species, but yes. there are some in the southern hemisphere too. Um, there's some in uh, along the coast of Chile, down on the subantarctic islands. Um, so southern elephant seals are uh, actually have a bigger nose. They're called elephant seals because the big males have a giant nose. Um, and the southern elephant seals are bigger than the northern elephant seals, but the northern elephant seals have a bigger nose. So that's our claim to fame. That is a beautiful claim to fame. It's fantastic. Thank you very much for that, uh, you two. Uh, we're going to go to Ms. Reed's class. They have a question now. If you want to unmute your mic, we'll head to you, and then we'll go back to Miss Lou in a second. Hi, guys. Go ahead. What do the, what do the elephant seals eat? Ooh, what's their what food? They, what do they eat? Yeah, um, it depends. Um, so... The female seals go way off into the middle of the ocean and they're eating a lot of the kind of really deep, uh, the fish that live really deep in the ocean. Um, they're called like lantern fish. Uh, there's just like big walls of fish down super deep in the ocean, uh, which is something I did not really realize before starting to study seals. Uh, but the males do something pretty different and someone will tell you. Yeah, um, adult males to have this strategy to get as much fish as possible, as much fatty fish as possible, to get super big and to stay super big. Um, and so they'll forage along the coastline um, where, and they're what we call benthic feeders. And so they'll feed on fish and other animals that are closer to the bottom of the ocean. And they'll feed on bigger fish like flounder and bigger squid and things like that. Um, and because that they stay closer to the coastline, they are more, they interact more with predators like great white sharks and killer whales or orcas. Um, and so they do experience higher mortality because of this foraging strategy. Um, but females uh, kind of have a lower risk strategy where they go further offshore, where they don't have predator, as many predators um, and feed on smaller schooling fish. Yeah. Very cool. I like the thought of this titanic battle with these elephant seals and great white sharks and uh, all sorts of amazing creatures uh, that are just gigantic off your coast. Very, very cool. I'm going to do a quick, uh, where I think we're back and everything's good. I'm going to just do a quick uh, picture of an elephant seal nose for our students that might not have seen this before because it is one of the freakiest big things in nature. I mean, there you are. That is just, it's a ridiculous nose. It's one of the silliest noses in the animal kingdom, I think. Uh, so there you are. You can take that in. <laughs> the joy of biology is that you get weird creatures all the time. Uh, Miss Lou's class, we're going to head back to you guys. We're going to do one more round. Um, the device is giving a little bit of trouble, so hopefully we're still good with all the connectivity in the next few minutes. And then we're going to let them go because it's getting chilly off on the coast of California. But Miss Lou, come on back in. Hey, guys. What are elephant seals predators, too? Ooh, what are their predators, if you got that? What are their predators? Yeah. Um, so main predators are great white sharks and killer whales. And actually, there was one seal down here earlier that had a big scar on its shoulder that I think maybe was from a, a bite from a great white shark. Um, the females go really far out to sea, probably because there's fewer predators there. It's safer for them. Um, but there might also be predators at depth. Uh, we think maybe sharks like sleeper sharks. Uh, might also be elephant seal predators, but it's hard to know for sure. Yeah, very, very well, cool. Sort of the two apex well, predators in the ocean. Oh, sorry, Selma. Sorry, I was just going to say, we'll also see animals with cookie cutter bark, cookie cutter shark bites on them. Um, that's not a complete predation event because they survive those, and that's pretty common. Um, but sharks get a little snack. I encourage everybody, when you're done this broadcast, look up a cookie cutter shark, which are adorable, and then look up their bites too. It's like you're just walking along, swimming along, and there's just this like perfect cookie-sized chunk that comes right out of your side. Um, little little monsters. Um, very cool. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Miss Threet's class, if you have a second question, come on and see me. I'm going to head to Miss Wafer's class first. Uh, come on back in. Hey, guys. Awesome. So, Aaliyah. Is in sixth grade. I have to tell you first that um, I used to live in California, and in January we would always go. I think it's between Big Sur and 
you know, uh, San Luis Obispo area there where there's all the, and just loved going there every January and checking them out. So I'm getting all kinds of like feelings when I'm seeing um, this uh, picture. Anyway, Aaliyah is in Virginia in sixth grade, wondering now that we've talked about the nose, what exactly is their nose for? What did they use it for? Yeah, great question. Do you want to take that one? Yeah, um, it's not fully known to do with how uh, males compete for females with one another. Um, so the nose can amplify sound. So when we see them on the beach and they're um, kind of vocal, the males are vocalizing with one another, it looks like they'll puff up their nose a bit um, and they'll kind of like almost like tuck it into their mouth. And we think that that helps like make their sound, make their kind of like mating call, if you will, um, just like more intimidating and louder uh, to scare off any competitors. Um, but besides that, we're not really sure if they use it for feeding because males are benthic feeders. We think it might help them like suck up fish off the seafloor uh, because it kind of like dangles there or help them at least cue into fish that are kind of hiding in the sand or something like that. Um, but those are the two big hypotheses that we think that that we think they use their nose for. Yeah, and if you've never heard a male elephant seal vocalize, it kind of sounds like if there was a motorcycle inside a gymnasium. Yeah. Um, it's like really echoey and like kind of Weir rumbly. Weirdest, best analogy ever. Thank you for that, Allison. A motorcycle <laughs> inside a gymnasium. I like that. that was... um, I'm going to email all our classes actually with a BBC fight clip of two elephant seals where you get the noise, you get the fight. Like it's one of the most incredible battles in the animal kingdom when they really go at it. So uh, really, really cool to follow up with this and stay tuned for that in your email. We're going to take one more question that we're going to leave our fantastic ecologist and evolutionary biologist to their research. Uh, Ms. Threet's class, come on in and uh, wrap us up. Hey, guys. How long can an elephant seals live for? Ooh, good question. Very good question. I'm working on a project on that right now. Um, but the females can live a relatively long time. They live about 22 years. Uh, there are, we know that in this population, um, or in the in the work that we've done, um, we've counted something like thirteen hundred uh, three year old seals, like over a thousand. And by the time there's twenty two, there's only like eight twenty two year olds. Yeah. So it's really really um, tough to live that long as a seal. Um, but that is the those are the the oldest animals. The males do not live as long. It's so much harder um, to be a male in this system because. It's just much more dangerous. They're having to fight all the time. Um, and they forage in those um, more predator rich environments like we just talked about. Yeah, and probably only one in nine elephant, male elephant seals will live to pass on their genes to the next generation. So we'll survive long enough to mate. Wow, very cool. But I like the idea of it being mainly related to them feeding in really dangerous waters. Like, so imagine going to the fridge and you have like a one in 10 chance of getting e eaten. Like, it's just terrifying. So this has been so, so much fun. Uh, and what an amazing view you guys get. Amazing science we get to do and, and share with our classes today. Before I bring in our classes, is there any last message you want to share about your work? Anything we can leave them to take home with about elephant seals, about the work you're doing uh, before we bring them in for a farewell? Uh, I think the last thing that I would share is just to uh, stay interested in, in nature and in the animals. And you can learn a lot just by watching them from a distance. Um, and I hope that you are always inspired by looking at these kinds of beautiful scenes to, to protect the ocean as well. Yeah. I just wanted to add that a lot of the questions you all asked today are questions that we're asking and that we're researching. So. Like like Allison said, kind of keep that curiosity and research questions really can be as simple as like, how long do elephant seals live and like, where are they eating and where like what eats them. So it doesn't have to be as like complicated as I think people think research is. Um, so just like stay interested, stay curious and keep looking at cool, interesting animals and nature around you. 
best possible message to leave with of all time. We've got our backyard bio campaign coming in May, getting kids around the world looking for nature near them. I really encourage you to look use the Seek app or iNaturalist, really amazing tools for learning about local wildlife near you. And just go for a walk. It's amazing what you'll find if you go outside and just take that opportunity to look. I mean, there might not be as creatures as charismatic as our elephant seals today, but I promise you, you will find something very, very neat if you just go outdoors. Alison Salma, the whole team there, thank you so, so much. This is so much fun for me personally. Professional detachment aside, I just love getting the chance to hang out on this amazing beach. <laughs> um, and I'm going to bring in our classes to say a big thank you and farewell as well. Stay tuned for that email. I'm sending you that elephant seal battle video. It's going to change your life. Uh, but Miss Lou's <laughs> class, Miss Reed's class, Miss Wafer, thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. All right, guys. We'll see you later.